Welcome. I'm Pat Soldano. I'm president of Family Enterprise USA. We promote generationally owned family business and their lifetime of savings at a national level in Washington, D.C. And I'm very pleased to have with me today Peter Lotta, who is CEO and chairman of A. Dewey Pyle. A. Dewey Pyle has been a family business since 1924. We're really pleased to have him join us for this call today and tell us a little bit about his family and the history of the company. So, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Pat, and thanks for having me. So, as you mentioned, we're a family-owned business, uh, founded of all days April 1st, April Fool's Day, 1924. So, next April 1st, we're going to have our centennial anniversary, and we're a third generation transitioning to fourth generation of, of ownership of the family business. In, in terms of a, an overview, like so many family businesses, it started with somebody having an idea and ambition. And my grandfather bought two trucks from his next door neighbor, uh, not because he necessarily had visions of getting into the trucking business, but the, the trucks were for sale. And so he bought the two trucks and and uh, he was the driver. And uh, it was a year or so until he had enough work that he needed to hire a second driver. So uh, our, our industry, the motor carrier industry, essentially breaks into three errors. There was the pre-regulation of the industry error, which uh, was up until 1935. And then from 35 to 1980, the industry was heavily regulated, treated much like a, a public utility with the idea of Congress that everybody needed equal access to transportation services. And then in 1980, the industry was deregulated. So during the regulatory era, there were certificates of operating authority very hard to obtain to operate in, in certain geographic areas. Carriers, believe it or not, were allowed to collectively so, uh, fix their prices, collectively set their prices with antitrust uh, immunity. And all that changed in 1980 when the industry was deregulated. So uh, to give you an idea of the disruptive effect of the deregulation uh, of the top 60 motor carriers in business, by re in terms of revenue in 1980, only four are still in business today. There's been that much disruption in the industry. So today, our pile world, we've expanded from a, a single LTL, less than truckload terminal in 1996 um, to now a, a Northeast regional LTL, less than truckload transportation provider. So that, that business is what we would call a for hire motor carrier. And we pick up and deliver shipments throughout our geographic footprint, which is the Canadian main border south to the Virginia, North Carolina border into eastern Ohio and all points in between. We're currently handling that less than truckload operation, about 12,000 shipments a day from 27 different service centers. Um, we also started a dedicated transportation uh, services business, unlike a for higher motor carrier, the dedicated customer wants exclusive use of your trucks and your drivers all the time. We started that in 2013 and have grown that from no drivers, no equipment to last year we ended the year with over 600 drivers, did about 140 million in that business. Uh, we own and operate over 4 million square feet of warehouse space in the Northeast where we serve as the distribution center for uh, customers that don't want their own bro bricks and mortar. Uh, we have a brokerage operation that is it really arranges transportation services for our customers on non-pile assets. And finally, our, our roots and origin, a uh, flatbed steel hauling legacy division. So today, uh, as we look at things since 1996, uh, we've expanded from less than 100 people on the team to uh, currently 4,000 pile people, as we call ourselves on the team. And uh, we'll do a little over 800 million in revenue um, from a, a standpoint of 10 million in revenue in 1995. Uh, we'll do it a little over 800. So that so that's our, our snapshot of Pile today. We're a, a, you know really a logistic solution provider in the Northeast. Uh, in terms of ownership, um, as I'm a third generation owner, um, my brother is the other third generation owner. We've consolidated ownership from five down to the two of third generation. I'm still active in the business. My brother's retired. There's, we've consolidated the ownership from 12 in the fourth generation to six. Um, three are active in the business. Uh, my son and my nephew 
who are owners of the business, fourth generation owners, and my my son in law, um, who is is also active in the business. You know, we talk about family businesses and you know succession of owners, but one thing interesting here to pile our culture. We have over 100 people today on our pile people team, not owners, who are span multiple generations of, of pile people. And uh, so we're pretty proud of the fact that people want their sons and daughters to come and become a part of the pile team. So it, just in a quick recap, I, I, I like to say we're professionally managed, but values driven. And um, the... Um, you know, we're in a service business. We live in a service world. So essentially, um, the the service of the pile of people, I think our strategic competitive advantage that allowed us to survive the catastrophic impact on so many family-owned businesses in the transportation motor carrier sector is the fact that our core values create a solid culture. That solid culture here at Pile uh, earns the trust of the pile of people and our customers and therefore leads to a higher level of discretionary effort by our pile people than our, our competition. And, and given the fact that we live in a service world, if our composite level of discretionary effort is higher and better than the competition, meaning we're working harder, we're trying harder, uh, we're going we're gonna to outperform. And, and that's been our secret sauce is the, the core values that support the culture that earn the trust that create the discretionary effort that has created the engagement of the pile people and commitment. That's very, very helpful. And, you know, I think it's really important that you continue to maintain these values and they so they are so important uh, to the business and the operation of the business. So maybe you could talk about that a little more as well as you have generations, it sounds like, of employees, which we found through the survey that we've done. In fact, 72% of family businesses have generation of employees. So do you have a sense, I mean, maybe I've never done a survey of your employees, kind of how many of your employees or how many generations do you have of employees maybe working in the business? So so we have, uh, I mean, I we just did an article in our pile press, which is a publication that's mailed at home three or four times a year. And my son wrote an article about the um, spanning of pile people amongst cross generations. So, I mean, we've had three, we have three generations uh, currently, fathers, grandfathers deceased, uh, son is, is a driver with us, his two sons are a driver with us, are drivers with us. Um, so we have, we have well over 100 people that are with us today who had predecessor grandparents, parents, you know, um, siblings that, that are pile people as well. That's that's really, really interesting. Um, and again, we, we find that unique to family businesses, because as we know, family businesses support not only their family uh, and their, their employees, of course, and also their community. So uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the regulation that you mentioned earlier. Um, very regulated, as you talked about the history of regulations uh, in the transportation industry. It, where is it today? I mean, are there uh, regulations, legislation that that has happened that are making your life much more difficult, and and I guess more importantly, is there something that Congress can help you do as an industry that would make your life easier? Well, there there is, uh, and you know, regulations get passed and they they outlive their useful time. And I'll give you a, a really good example here in Pennsylvania in 2014, something called the Spotted lantern fly was introduced in Berks County, which is an adjacent county to Chester County. Um, and, and it became a bit of the rage. The Pennsylvania Agricultural Department required that we train all our drivers on identifying spotted lanterns, uh, inspecting their equipment anytime they would leave a delivery or a pickup location, uh, how to try to catch these hoppers. They're not, they're not actually flies, they're hoppers. And if you've ever tried to kill one, uh, you, you go. You better be pretty quick and pretty agile. So that was in 2014. The spotted lanternfly is now, according to my reading, in over 15 different states, expanded well beyond Berks County. And believe it or not, we still have to train all new drivers to 
on the spot at Lanternfly and preventative measures. And this week, ironically, we have the Department of Agriculture coming in to audit us on our compliance with spotted lanternfly engagement. And I, I have a farm property and I'm telling you, there's spotted lanternflies everywhere last year. And so, you know, here's a, here's a, a regulation that's out lived its useful life. I'll give you another example, federal excise tax, okay, on heavy duty equipment, trucks and trailers. The federal excise tax was enacted in 1917. It was a 3% tax on heavy equipment to fund World War I. Today, the federal excise tax is 12%. And last time I looked in my history book, World War I ended in 1918. So the federal excise tax continues. You know, just two more quick examples. One, these you know, electric trucks. I mean, everybody, we're, we're environmentally conscious, but the, the politicians are way out over their ski tips on the electric trucks in the heavy duty class eight market. A, the infrastructure isn't there to support it. B, the, you know, the, the, the nickel and, and lithium and things that are mined to create electric vehicles are A, energy consumptive, consumption intensive, and B, are not environmentally friendly. Um, you know, you have, you can carry less on the truck because of the weight of the batteries. You only get, you know, a few hours of running time. Then you have to spend a, you know, a, an inordinate amount of time recharging. We have backup generation capability at all our facilities so we can operate as an overnight delivery carrier 24 seven. We'd need a generator the size of an aircraft carrier to charge 150 trucks for that backup capability. And for all that, you get to pay 3x more for the truck than you pay for a, an ultra clean diesel uh, that has low, um, you know, NOx and, and emissions. And, it, you know, so they're turning the turning the our industry upside down with the threats of when are you going to have to have electric vehicles and the, the power infrastructure can't support it. Here's a, a last easy one, common sense, right? So. As a service business, when the 4th of July holiday comes up and it's on a Tuesday or a Thursday, it is a nightmare scheduling. Who's working? Who's closed Monday and Tuesday? Who's open? You know, whatever. And, you know, we have a lot of young family employees with young kids that don't have long tenures of employment. They can't get a summer vacation. So an easy, nice thing to do by our government would be say, make Independence Day the first Monday in July, just like. You know, Memorial Day gives a three-day weekend to a young family. Labor Day on a Monday, the observed day, gives a three-day weekend. It would make business more efficient. It would make a lot of young families in the middle of the summer have time to have a vacation, long weekend with their kids. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that a lot of times our government doesn't think about. How do we, how do we serve the people? That would be a great way to serve the people. You know, I, I, I understand the history of July 4th, but I call it Independence Day. And I would lobby for making it the first Monday or first Friday in July and call it a day, give people a nice long three-day weekend and make business more efficient. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. It is kind of sad that some of these common sense uh, regulations, legislations don't happen. And it's in also very interesting that when we poll the voter around what kind of politician they want, uh, moderate and mainstream are at the bottom of the list. And you might be surprised to know at the top of the list, number one is a politician with common sense. So maybe yeah. there's hope, Peter. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, here's I... one more common sense and then I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, Pat. So a as a motor carrier, we have trucks on the highways every day. And, you know, our industry is a target for many unwarranted, meritless, even fraudulent auto liability claims by the, the plaintiff's bar. And, you know, you've seen the signs like I have, you know, the, the big billboards, if you've been, you know, injured, if you've been hurt, if somebody else has wronged you, in your opinion, you know, call 1-800-GET-RICH-QUICK. And, hey, well, I graduated from law school in 83. Lawyers weren't allowed to advertise and troll for clients like that. It would have, it would have violated the code of ethics. So the combination of a very tight excess liability market that reduces available insurance, excess insurance limits, 
raises the cost significantly, really puts motor carriers, family owned motor carriers, all motor carriers at, at a high risk where you don't have the insurance and you get one of these nuclear verdicts. Um, there, there was a public trucking company that got a nuclear verdict, $90 million. Their driver was in Texas under good speed control in snowy conditions, icy conditions. Motors came across the lane, hit the truck head on, and the jury found that that truck should not have been on the road and awarded $90 million uh, judgment to the, to the plaintiff's counsel. And what about the car that was on the road that came across and hit the truck head on in the other lane? But the common sense, back to the common sense, simple solution, real judicial reform could be achieved easily if there weren't so many lawyers in, in Congress by simply eliminating the contingent fees that bear absolutely no economic rationale to the legal costs incurred to bring that case forward and letting the loser pay the winner's legal cost. And, you know, I mean, think about it for a second. Teachers, we would never stand for teachers being paid 35% of the student's lifetime earnings, yet we allow plaintiff's lawyers to do that every day. And, you know, with those two common sense reforms, we'd have a lot less need for judges because all that unnecessary litigation nonsense would be gone. And secondly, a lot less tax dollars would be consumed by the uh, American judicial system. So, you know, again, I, I know I live in a wacky world, but that's there's common sense reform that would stop abuse and help business. Yeah, and I think the further point there is if some of these common sense reforms would actually happen, legislation, regulation, it would make the company more profitable. And the, the good news about that is if there's more profit, there's more money to give to the community. And we have learned that the more profitable family businesses are, the more they give. And we've also learned that you know 80% of them support their local communities um, and even some of those national at a local level, but they give local. So let's talk about that a little bit in, in terms of your company and, and how you support the, the, the philanthropic community, the giving that you do, the services that the company does, uh, those kinds of things. Sure, sure, Pat. So, so first and foremost, you know, we believe that being a good, responsible corporate citizen in your community is the biggest contribution you can make where, you know, we're in 14 different Northeast states with either our L less than truckload service centers, uh, our tr dedicated transportation hubs, our warehouses. And by creating good, sustainable jobs that are good pay and good benefit, that benefits the local communities that we're in and provides a good, stable employment opportunity for our people that live in those communities to be volunteer firemen, to be scout troop leaders, uh, to participate and support the little leagues, you know, the activities that take kids off the street and, and you know, give them constructive development opportunities. Um, the other thing, you know, we're, we're supporters of, you know, we try not to plow a mile wide and an inch deep, um, you know, the, the, um, the charitable hospitals, uh, we like to support the volunteer fire companies. You know, here you have people that are working during the day or night that make themselves available to help others, either on ambulance calls or, or you know, volunteer fire companies. So we, we like to support those kind of things. <clears throat> the other thing we, we try to do, we are believe in train for, you know, hire for attitude, train for skills. So we have commercial drivers, uh, licensed qualified drivers, the market is tight, fleet technicians, the market is tight. So we have a, a, a de development program to invest in our people. So people will start in our loading docks or warehouses. They'll progress and be trained to drive a non-commercial license required tri truck. We call it our ES Express Solutions. And then from there, after six or months or 10 months, they'll go into our TDA Truck Driving Academy. They're paid for 10 weeks during that program. We have full-time pile instructors at our facilities where we operate the schools, and they are taught how to be a good commercial professional driver and pass their, their CDL, uh, commercial driver's license test, verbal 
and all uh, written and also um, skills based. And and so there were, you know, adding skill based people into the community. We also have a very active leadership development program that we hire recent college graduates, former military retired people, and also pile people that are with us today in a different capacity that have ambition and ability to advance. Uh, we just started the, the we do two LDP, we call it leadership development classes. Year 18 started on Monday. It's a six month program and then they'll go into a, an assignment and pile. So we believe, Pat, that that's investing in the community by raising the skill set and allowing people opportunity to make more money and to uh, provide more secure livings and, and, and for their families. Well, that's very, very helpful. And I, I think it is very important that you really work hard to engage all of the community in, in the nation, for that matter, in the states that you work, to build more of a pile team, to really promote more jobs, pr promote career achievement, uh, as well as give to so much of the not-for-profit community as well. So, Peter, really appreciate uh, your time today. Uh, is there any final words that you'd like to, to say? No, I, I think, uh, I mean, family businesses are the backbone of America. And, you know, I think a big difference in family business, I like to say, you know, unlike some many public companies, we don't manage for the financial quarter to quarter outlook. We Our decisions aren't quarterly driven, they're lifetime driven because we're in it for the long term. And, and I think the, you know, it's, it's great to have an organization like yours, uh, ours, that is you know, really promoting the benefits that family business bring to America, bring to our local communities, and really are that source of good sustainability and and um, opportunity uh, for people. And, you know, we, we love doing business with family businesses because we know they really take a long-term view. And, and you can connect as family-owned businesses to some of the things that are priorities for family-owned businesses. So, uh, it, you know, you need the publics, you need the private equities, you need the family businesses. And, and you know, we're glad that, uh, you know, the Family Enterprise uh, USA is there to help support family businesses in America. Well, again, thanks, Peter. I really appreciate, appreciate your kind remarks. We do work hard at making sure our members of Congress and then voters understand family businesses, because as we've learned, they don't. And so we represent all sizes of family businesses in all industries. We think it's critical that they have a voice in D.C., and we're, we're, we're glad to be that voice. So once again, thank you so much for being on the call today um, and all that you have just shared with us. And we will definitely stay in touch. So have a great day.